Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello everybody, welcome back to the great experiments in psychology. In today's session, we are going to talk about a very interesting case study in play therapy. This is about a boy, about the boy who needed to play. And this is, uh, I am taking the excerpts from uh, a very famous book, which is one of the most public, uh, most uh, popular readings in play therapy and written by Virginia Axlin in 1964 and the name of the child is Dibs. So, uh, this is uh, today's study is about Dibs in search of self by Virginia Axlin 1964. So, uh, why have we included this as a part of our uh, experiments and studies in great experiments in psychology. One of the reasons being that this gives us a view into what uh, what is the child's perspective is uh, when he is going through emotional trouble and how uh, this gives a different view again of how to deal with the situation. So, we will uh, go through Dib's life and uh, I mean childhood years and how uh, his emotional trauma was helped by Virginia. He was over able to overcome his trauma by the help of uh, Miss Axlin in uh, and uh, this uh, th through play therapy. So, to understand the story of Dibs, basically we will have to talk about Virginia Axlin, who is the main architect, architect of non-directive play, play therapy and her account uh, has been put uh, in public, uh, she has worked a lot on play therapy in the early 1950s and this specially account has been uh, was uh, of a 6 year old child named Dibs and uh, she has put this on uh, her famous book Dibs in search of cell. So, today's uh, study is on Dibs in search of cell. The key points of this study that will emanate as you as we see is never to give up trying and not to allow people to shirk off their responsibility. It is wrong to assume children that, that uh, to assume that children do not know what they are up to and allowing children to express strong emotions and acknowledging the reality of those emotions enables children to deal with these emotions themselves. This is a very important point for therapists who are listening to this lecture or who are would be therapists primarily because that most of the times we as a therapist we have this attitude of just going up and helping. So, it would be a good idea to let the children to acknowledge the emotions, but also let the children deal with it themselves. And once children are secure in a relationship, it is ex expected that they can make the decisions by themselves. So, um, through this uh, discussion on dibs, we will go through a journey and we will also understand how to deal with an emotionally difficult child and also what were the objectives of play therapy are or what are the objectives of play therapy and how to deal, how to actually get play therapy into action. This is a clear look into it. So, um, to start off with the story of Dibs, so in the, the book starts with uh, Dibs who is a six year who is a, a six year old child who goes to uh, play school uh, and uh, there uh, he is uh, he generally stands in the corner of the room and when he enters he does not make any move to get into the classroom but there has to be somebody who has who assists him one of the teachers actually uh, would always open his coat for him and his hat for him and then take him to the class. So, he would not take any independent step. The child would not look at anybody, he would sit or stand in the corner of the room almost near the wall and keep touching the wall, not touching the objects around the wall 
generally by all by himself. So, uh, the story of Dibs starts with Dibs who stands alone in the middle of the playroom. The five year old stares straight ahead seemingly unaware of the children playing all around him. His hands, hands swung lifeless by his side and he remained completely motionless. His only movements were made when anybody approached him. He would hit out wildly and try to bite or scratch them. Eventually, he went and laid under the table with his head bowed where he remained for the rest of the session. It was obvious to anyone who met Dibs that he had severe behavioral problems. Although the teachers had a warm affection for Dibs, they found it impossible to work with him and his mother declared him mentally abnormal and retarded at birth. So, this is basically the underlying story that brings Virginia Axlin or the clinical psychologist into action. And when actually this was what was happening in school where Dibs was uh, not interacting with the other children, we will see the uh, Dibs behavior. So, he did not speak to people, there was no eye contact, he preferred staying alone, he did not interact with people in any way. So, even non not even non verbally. So, there are many children who might not uh, wish to talk to others, but they would perhaps pass a uh, uh, pen to a friend or you know another uh, child or maybe uh, hold his hand or do something together. So, Dibs on the other hand would not interact with anyone in any way and he often stood at minutes on end with his head buried in his arms leaning against the wall. So, the action would be something like this and he would prefer to be by the wall. Sometimes, he sat in the place same place all morning not moving and not saying a word. He loved books. So, he would def, uh, he would go around the wall touch the books occasionally he would pick out one and keep uh, looking at it and the teachers felt especially there was a teacher named Hedda who felt that she he, he could learn he had uh, the ability to read. So, during the time the story time when the story time came for the children and they would uh, sit in a circle on a table with a teacher and they would show their things and say stories about it or the, the teacher would narrate a story. Dips would always be crouching under a table and so he was more um, if he wished he could actually in such an angle that he would be able to see the thing or the objects that the children showed and he could hear the story that was being said. In the playground, Dips behavior was very different from the other children. So, when the other children played together or played with objects. Um, other sports activities where they participated or they use the slide and the swing. Uh, Dibs generally took up a stick and he kept scratching the mud with a stick. In fact, in the first day when uh, Axlin visited the school and uh, he, he she went through uh, Dibs da daily activities in school, she saw the same thing that he was scratching the ground with a stick. And he was generally overall a silent, a withdrawn and an unhappy child. The, the problem was that though his, uh, though most of the uh, teachers felt that there was something wrong with him, but they did not uh, give up on him. And the problem actually was that they could not even sign him off as a mentally retarded child. Now, Dibs came from a family where his parents were, his mother was a surgeon and his father was a very famous scientist. So, um, they to them this child was clearly abnormal who did not wish to talk, who did not wish to interact, but um, to the teachers who saw him da daily, they felt that no there was something wrong with this child probably emotionally rather than retardation, especially when he was sitting with the books. So, he would do all his activities by himself, if anybody really disturbed him or you know even went near him, he would scratch at them and bite them and uh, throw things away and he would never ever smile. So, none of the teachers of his school had actually ever seen him smile. 
So they were, the teachers were pretty convinced that something had to be done with this child. And then uh, there was this, uh, the school received several complaints about dips, disruptive behavior and aggressive behavior, especially from the other parents whose children uh, dips had uh, sometime uh, bitten or scratched. And the staff arranged for him to be seen by, uh, to be uh, undergo psychological tests by the school psychologist. Unfortunately, Dibbs did not participate at all with the school psychologist and therefore no test could be done. Also the pediatrician of the school uh, saw him and he was also exasperated by Dibbs behavior. So there was, uh, they were really not sure what exactly was going on. And so, the question was, was he mentally retarded, was he autistic, did he have some mental illness? His parents had actually thought that he might have schizophrenia. If it is not mental, um, if, he, if he does not have a brain issue, then definitely it is schizophrenia and if he is not retarded. So, they had actually taken him to a psychiatrist who denied having any problems, uh, who denied seeing any problems with the child. In fact, the psychiatrist had recommended treatment for the mother. And, um, but nevertheless, Dips was here in school, he was definitely having some problems, he was absolutely not like the other children and uh, they, the teachers did not know what to do with him. So, exasperated in such a condition, they finally and this uh, mind you, the Dips was coming from uh, as I have told you about his background, he was coming from a family which was really rich and influential and uh, they were from the academia and uh, Dips mother had uh, persuaded the school which was again a very uh, high up end school to take in Dips. Uh, so, uh, so, they were really uh, not sure what to do with Dibs and they before signing him off or uh, you know asking him to leave the school, they wanted uh, Dibs to be seen by a clinical psychologist. At this point in time, um, Virginia Axlin was actually well known for her work in play therapy and uh, thus uh, she, was al she was already working on play therapy for quite a while and then therefore, uh, somebody had recommended uh, this case to uh, Virginia Axlin and she was requested by the teachers to come to school to see Dibs. So, and provide play therapy for him. So, this is how um, Dibs basically um, got into an interaction with Axlin. Now, um, the, the one of the other strange things about Dibs was in school, I forgot to mention that uh, though he did not interact with anybody, most of the times he was crouching under the table or staring uh, at something for uh, an hour at length or maybe just uh, sitting aside near the wall, he would never want to go home, he would still prefer school. So, he would fight and scratch and bite people if he was when the school time was up and it was lunch time for everybody to go home. He would not wish to go home and most of the times his mother would come in late. So, that all this uh, fighting and uh, putting on the coat all the uh, stuff was over and many times he did not wish to go with his mother. So, then the chauffeur would be asked to of his um, of his mother's car would be asked to come and pick him up and take him as if he was like an object. And during these times either he would fight or he would just become limp and go. But he would never behave this way when he uh, came to school. So, he was very prompt about coming to school and he was never absent. So, the, this also added to the teacher's opinions that there was something emotionally wrong with the child and something that required treatment. In fact, the teachers were also uh, very concerned about the family's treatment towards Dibs as compared to uh, labeling him as a mentally retarded child. So, um, now talking about, we spoke about Virginia Axlin and uh, play therapy and she was already prominent and well known in the academic circles for play therapy. Then what is play therapy? 
So, play therapy is a structured and theoretically based approach to uh, therapy that builds on the normal communicative and learning processes of children. So, this is a definition given by Carmichael and it has also been supported by the others. Now, what the use of play therapy is to help children express what is troubling them when they do not have the verbal language to express their thoughts and feelings. In fact, many times it is seen that even when the child has an access to verbal language, he might not uh, be able to select the right words when in emotional distress or most of the times, you know, even if they have an access, they would prefer to uh, simulate it or express their emotions through play. So, without probably that was less that is less alarming to the child as compared to speaking out the thoughts even if the la child has uh, the use of language. And through play therapists may help children learn more adaptive behaviors when there are emotional or social skills deficits. So, the play therapy not only helps the child to express his feelings but or for the therapist to understand the underlying trauma or the emotional turbulence that the child is going through, it also helps to train the child in social skills and emotional skills. So, uh, many times it is done through role play uh, where the child is taught uh, through puppets say that uh, if such a thing happens at home, say if there is a fight at home between parents, then uh, how would you respond to it? How would this uh, baby bear respond to it? So, this you know just through play, just through um, role play in this case, there uh, many times a lot of emotion uh, you know the appropriate emotional and social skills are taught to the child. The positive relationships that develop between therapist and child during play therapy sessions can provide a corrective emotional experience necessary for healing. Most of the times when we see children uh, during uh, having emotional problems, the underlying problems probably most of the times as I said have uh, been uh, somewhere in the home setting, uh, the home front and um, they, they have many times it gives the child uh, an understanding that uh, these uh, relationships are, uh, so uh, uh, these are conflicting relationships. So, the mother and child relationship perhaps or the uh, father and child relationship is disturbed and the child starts generalizing it to other relationships also. So, that uh, say for example, nobody can be trusted or I cannot have faith in people. Now, the relationship between the child and the uh, therapist being an unconditional um, relationship. So, as in it is um, uh, not based on uh, you know uh, any uh, uh, any positive any condition that you know I am going to like you if you do well in this. So, it is unconditional re positive regard as uh, Rogers puts it. So, that is why it the trust and belief in relationships per se is also brought out through therapy. The goal of the therapy perhaps uh, is the primary goal of the therapy of play therapy is to uh, elicit the emotional uh, turbulence or the emotional problems of the child and make the child express. But on the other hand, it also helps to identify that uh, the type of problems that the uh, you know that uh, that has affected his belief system or is actually affecting the belief system, structuring the belief systems of the child. So, there you know the relationship, the rapport between the therapist and the child also works as a corrective uh, emotional experience and which is also necessary for healing. Play therapy may also be used to promote cognitive development and provide insight about and resolution of inner conflicts of dysfunctional thinking in the child. So, as I was just mentioning that many times the beliefs, there may be some belief system that is forming and maybe some dysfunctional thinking patterns that the child is developing through um, un, um, uh, through you know unwanted um, 
um, relationship problems at home perhaps so these things um, you know they, so the therapy also provides a corrective platform for uh, be, you know restructuring the thought pattern so play therapy uh, are, there are two types of play therapy so one is the non directive play therapy and the directive play therapy so non directive play therapy allows the child free reign in the playroom and they can play with anything that interests them so the here the therapist listens or records to the, the behavior and either with video or uh, writes down the notes or behind a one way mirror and the therapist uses the factual comments on the behavior such as so you are going to play with the father doll today to allow the play to develop so the work of the therapist is just to you know um, to, to keep the child in the activity whatever activity the child is interested in so it is to keep the child engaged so it's not like uh, directing the the area of play the focus of play the objective of play directive play therapy uh, or in the indirective play therapy the therapist takes a more active role in the play so he gives suggestions as to the appropriate games to play and use this uses the sessions to for specific diagnostic purposes so the role playing scenes are enacted to symbolize child's own life experiences and then work with possible solutions so generally when we are trying to use uh, train social skills or emotional skills in a child then directive play therapy is often used so but for exploration again uh, the non directive play therapy is used so when you are actually not telling the child to do anything so he does whatever he likes for the one hour that he got that he has he does whatever he likes he plays with whatever things he so it's basically we say it's a projection of your own thoughts into the uh, object into the play object and that is how the child is expressing so many times the child as we will see in dibs what dibs dad does is um, he he takes up uh, the so there was a doll house in the uh, play room where dibs did not uh, prefer the walls in the doll house so he kept kept saying that no walls no locks dibs likes no locks so mm, probably because most of the time he was shut up in a room and the door was locked so he did not prefer a room with locked doors so uh, in the doll house what he, he would uh, take out uh, the doors and remove uh, all the walls so the doll house had no walls for him so he did not like walls so um, basically um, he um, actually starts using non directive play therapy for dibs and after a lot of um, uh, conjecture dibs parents agree uh, to send uh, dibs for play therapy for an hour in to maxlin's um, center so uh, their um, child guidance center uh, initially dibs parents dibs mother wanted him to, uh, his therapy to be continued at dibs house they were uh, as i mentioned earlier they were rich family and they uh, dibs had a play room uh, in his house so and the mother said that we could get anything that uh, you wanted but um, uh, because of the insistence of uh, axlin they decided they agreed finally agreed to send dibs to the uh, child guidance center now in the interaction if you go through the book it's a very interesting piece where in the interaction uh, axlin mentions that dibs mother the way she portrays her child um, he, she she says that it's like they have no hope for the child they know that the child is retarded and if Uh, axlin wishes to use him as a uh, scientific data for her study for her research then that was okay with them but uh, they did not actually uh, see it uh, see any hope for improvement in dibs now uh, the so the session started with a 1 hour every thursday and uh, the objective was uh, to the dip was given a chance to take charge of the sessions and direct the play activities himself so it would as i said in non directive play but the objective was to give the opportunity 
give him the opportunity to overcome any negative feelings and symbolically triumph over the upsets and traumas that was disturbing him. So, through play whoever was actually disturbing him the objective was to allow him to overcome them through play and he could do this in his own safe and accepting environment. That was one of the reasons why Axelin decided on continuing the play therapy sessions in her in the child guidance center instead of um, Dib's house where he was already feeling a bondage. So, um, how would Dibs cope with this new situation? So, the play therapy room used by Axelin consisted of a doll's house with numerous dolls, toy cars, sand pit, watercolor and fingerprints, uh, paints, drawing paper materials and an inflatable doll that, doll that bounced upright when hit. So, in his first session, Dibs came with his mother and he held uh, Maxlin's hand walked up to the playroom. Earlier mind you, uh, when Maxlin had gone to Dibs school to observe him, that day also um, he did hold Maxlin's hand and he never touched anybody. So, this was the first time he held Maxlin's hand, any other stranger's hand and walked with the stranger till the playroom and he played with the things there. Now, uh, in the first session in the child guidance center, he came with his mother and on uh, reaching the doll's house, so he was uh, moving around in the playroom and on reaching, naming each object in a monotonous voice, so he could, he actually could uh, identify all the objects and we will see that he could also read. So, on reaching the doll's house, he sobbed urgently, no locked doors, no locked doors, he repeated over and over again and he did not like locked doors as we mentioned. So, the therapeutic process was beginning that is what Maxlin thought and at the end of the session again just like school he did not wish to go home. So, there was a lot of fighting and arguments uh, fighting and biting and things and then uh, Maxlin uh, here he was in a dilemma whether to uh, really go with the child or let him be. So, uh, participate in the um, uh, conversation or convince the child to leave. So, finally, she decided that no, she had to let uh, him be independent. The objective of the therapy would also be to make um, Tibbs independent as an individual. So, it would not be right to uh, be there during the time when he was going home. So, after the session she walked back to her office and Dibs continued the go no go situation with his with his mother. In the second visit uh, Dibs played with colors and easel and could name colors and also read the labels in all the colors. He knew all the colors, he knew how to read the labels and uh, this non-directive therapeutic technique allowed Dibs the freedom to direct the play himself and Dibs set the pace of the interaction and decided on the play activity. So, what would happen is he decided like on the, on the third day he decided that he wished to have a tea party. So, uh, he, he would also test Maxlin. he would uh, put uh, dip his fingers in the color uh, paints and then remove it, keep the water open for a long time in the sink just to see what Maxlin would do. Initially, he would not uh, have eye to eye contact with Maxlin, but gradually with time, he started interacting with Maxlin and also developed his language. So, dips earlier would uh, always address himself as you. So, you would like to open your coat. So, he, so Max Lin would again point out, you want me to open your coat, to help you open your coat. So, this way Dibs actually learned the use of the pronouns for himself. Also, another interesting thing that was seen was that whenever Dibs was emotional, so he was disturbed, the language would get affected. So, uh, in this, in this, uh, through these visits every day and through this non-directive play, Axlin was actually being the catalyst for Dibs to identify his true self and she gave him a chance to work through his feelings in a non-threatening environment. Mind you, 
play therapy's objective primarily is to provide an environment for the child which is non-threatening. So, if we have so in many schools these days, especially with the Montessori schools, you have a play room. So, some of the pediatrics, uh, pediatrician centers also do have a play room. So, one of the, the major objective of this is to provide an environment which is non-threatening to the child. So, a child when, um, if again, you know, if the child especially is going, having uh, emotional issues to be dealt with, which is keeping him withdrawn, then play would probably the best be the best way to bring out those um, un, undes, unresolved conflicts uh, out in the open, because they would not be the child would not need to direct it towards an alarming figure, say the father or the mother who are much bigger than him and who might harm him. So, pl through play therapy, he could easily uh, project these ang this anger, uh, this frustration through to a soldier, to a toy soldier. And many times it was seen that say for three toy soldiers, uh, Dibs buried them in sand and said they are gone forever. So, uh, and he also asked Axlin in one of the sessions to keep it like that. So, he would come and see it the next Thursday that things were same. So, uh, uh, through the progress of therapy, it was seen that Debs could actually read very well. In fact, in the second session, Debs could read therapy. So, he read it as the rapi. So, then after Axelin told him and he, uh, he, he could clearly read well, he, his functioning was way better than the children of his age. And he was very uh, happy about the fact that every week had a Thursday, because Thursdays would be the days when he would come to meet um, Axelin in the play therapy, for the play therapy session. And he uh, addressed Axelin as Mrs. Miss A. So, uh, later on with an interaction with Dib's parents, finally just before the end of the sessions, it was seen that um, I told you earlier that uh, Dib's mother was a surgeon and the father was a scientist and it came out uh, during the final interaction with the mother that she did not wish to have this child. And uh, there was another sister that Dibs had and the mother kept saying that she was a perfect child. So, Dorothy or the elder uh, other sister that Dibs had was um, appreciated by uh, the parents, especially because these parents were very in intellectual and their, their way of assessing the children were through intellectual capacity. Now, Dibs uh, he did not express himself and probably that would be his, um, so to them he was a shame and embarrassment. So, they kept him locked away as much as they could and not trying to bring him out into society, so to public interactions. Now, this thing, so the more they did that, the more uh, Dibs used his anger and to withdraw into his shell and he stopped interacting with people. Actually, how important these interactions are with children has been seen in several studies earlier. One of the major studies uh, with children uh, was uh, with a child called Jeannie. Uh, and if you just look up, if you google up genie, you will see that uh, this is, this was one child, uh, is, uh, she was called the feral child or the wild child, who was kept locked up because his father, because her father did not uh, want a child and uh, did not feel she was weak and she was most of the times locked up in the room, so much so that she actually did not develop language skills. Mm, she could not walk properly, she was extremely malnourished and um, when the child was identified, it was uh, quite late um, when the mother had taken her uh, to, um, uh, to a social uh, security, uh, some, uh, some NGO sort of a center and there uh, when it was identified, uh, then after that uh, the, it was a lot of research was done on Jeannie and the effects of uh, you know low environmental support or interaction uh, was uh, left a mark uh, throughout the life of Jeannie. The same has been studied way back in uh, the 1700s by Itard who actually studied a, a boy called Victor. 
So, you can uh, that is also a very uh, interesting study where uh, is known as the victor in the wilds and once when he came he could not um, speak the language speak the language he of the social norms social norms and standing up and um, also he the way it did not matter to him whether he was eating raw food or cooked food so he did not finally ita did not really pick up the language at all so the uh, finally victor did not pick up the language at all ita worked with him for quite some time but uh, so basically uh, you know even in the case of dibs it was seen that uh, this uh, uh, this locking him up keeping him away uh, not interacting with him had made dibs move get into a shell of his own and he also uh, his just like his parents his resort was again intellectual skills so he also when he started um, coming out so that's why he liked books he liked looking at books he liked reading things so the mother at the end when he was uh, perfectly healthy and happy um, uh, then uh, the mother uh, at the end of therapy uh, disclosed that she had started teaching uh, the child to read uh, letters uh, way before 2 years age of age and uh, dibs could actually read by 2 years of age so in dibs last session with axlin he was very relaxed outgoing and happy and all his behavior was spontaneous he said a final goodbye to the lady of the wonderful playroom and uh, after that uh, basically uh, a, a week after uh, the final session an iq test was done on dibs to see his uh, concepts uh, his problem solving ability uh, the acquisition of information reasoning and other intellectual operations and it was seen that dibs had an iq of 168 so imagine they started with thinking that this child was perhaps a retarded child so perhaps he had a mental disability of some sort so probably a mental illness but he uh, here was a child with an iq of 168 and less than 1 person in a thousand would score as high as him and in fact if he did not he got so bored with the test iq test that he did not finish reading the reading part of it so probably uh, you know by then he had already scored 168 so later on he uh, he he actually got to meet axlin once and there it was seen uh, dibs uh, remembered axlin he also remembered that after 2 years he met axlin coincidentally on the road and uh, dibs remembered exactly the number of days uh, before how many thursdays before he had had a, the last session with axlin and later on uh, when uh, quite several years later by then maxlin was uh, you know pretty prominent in her circle uh, dealing with uh, emotional uh, turbulence of children especially uh, through play therapy and there one of her friends showed a letter uh, from a school where a child uh, a 15 year old boy had written an eloquent letter uh, complaining about the steps that uh, the administ school administration should take for uh, treating children uh, for helping children who are ill treated so this um, and that letter uh, was written extremely eloquently and was followed up uh, the administration was planning to follow it up and this letter when showed to axlin she saw that it was actually written by dibs so now as an assessment of play therapy so how uh, is it whether it's good whether it's bad or whether it's doable so the most important part uh, is it is difficult to evaluate the success of play therapy primarily because you're dealing with one individual at a time and what kind of measure of success might be employed the therapy that dibs went through appears to be successful but what brought this about was it the play activities the toys the relationship with axlin the one to one contact or merely the developmental maturation that helped dibs or 
was it a combination of it all so we actually don't know and the problem is that this is very individualistic and tailor made for each child so an assessment of play therapy would really be tough and one of the major uh, criticisms of play therapy is it lacks experimental rigor so though we are talking of psychology as a science today and that is why we have uh, we are discussing so many cases, but I still felt that it would be important to discuss this case that because when we are talking of individuals many times each case is each individual is important when we are discussing cases. So, it is not only a quantitative study that is important in psychology. So, psychology deals with numbers it exp we try to um, we are trying to show that it can actually uh, exp be experimentally verifiable, but there are uh, the case studies especially uh, you know single case studies are also important. So, the qualitative material in psychology is also important for analyzing data and to understand human behavior. In fact, I will end this lecture just by uh, one of Dibbs sayings. So, during his therapy Dibbs once said every child should have a hill of all, all of his own to climb and Dibbs had had a higher hill than most, but through hard work, patience, commitment and guidance he had reached the top and was enjoying the view. He had found his sense of self. Thank you.